as I said, uh, and I'm here to give a presentation about heat pumps. I subtitled this when I first gave it, uh, my journey from analysis paralysis to screw it, let's do it. Um, I'll give a brief introduction about myself. I'm a software engineer at a company called Red Hat. My current focus is actually on uh, in-vehicle automotive software. I tend to overthink things, and I sometimes risk over explaining them, and that was certainly the analysis paralysis that I found myself in for a while. But at least as relates to uh, home electrification and insulation, I've had some recent successes uh, adopting the screw it, let's do it philosophy, and I'm happy to share a bit about what I've done, and I hope it's helpful. Um, I definitely would like to characterize myself as an enthusiastic amateur. So there's a lot of other resources that I've used, people far more knowledgeable than me. I just wanted to give an overview of my experience, and I'm certainly uh, happy to give some additional pointers after this. Um, my goal, uh, and I guess this was here again, you see I originally gave this to a group of, of EV enthusiasts, the uh, Western Suburbs Electric Vehicle Group. But um, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in electrification as part of a broader uh, interest in sustainability and environmentalism. Um, I know that uh, cars get a lot of attention on the electrification front for, uh, for good reasons, uh, and it's very exciting to see what's happening there, but there's also a tremendous opportunity to decarbonize by electrifying homes. And I think this bumper sticker kind of wraps that up in a nice pithy package. Um, can you electrify home heating in this climate? And uh, my answer is an enthusiastic yes. This is our home. Uh, it is in Rogers Park. It is 1,600 square feet. And we also have a 600 square foot basement that although it's not finished, it's part of the insulated envelope of the home. It was built in 1892, uh, definitely not with electric heating in mind. In fact, it had two coal fireplaces originally, one of which we still have. We actually have a wood stove in it now. Um, we had a dual zone conventional AC and furnace installed in 2010 but we have uh, converted to fully electric heating and cooling since the spring of last year. So we actually just celebrated a, a one year anniversary of full electrification of home heating. Uh, here is some proof. This is a year with uh, natural gas heating followed by this year. The red line shows the actual heating demand in degree days, which is a concept we'll talk about a little later. And so I, I'm not kidding here. Uh, we have not used a natural gas for heating. The little blue um, things you see there are we still have a, a hot water heater and a, a um, Close dryer that use natural gas, and we're working on replacing those as well. So, and how did we do it? We did it with heat pumps. This is the first one that we installed. Um, this happens to be an air source heat pump. So, heat pumps are devices that draw heat from the environment and put it into your home. And how do they do this? How do they do this even when it's cold? And I, I think this is something I, I have struggled to come up with a great way to explain, but I think it's you know it's something you have to address right off the bat. Is how does how could that even work? How can you heat using heat from the environment when the environment is cold? And the best way I've come up to explain this, that if you accept how air conditioning works, uh, all you need to do is reverse your thinking to understand how a true bi-directional heat pump works in the winter. So if you air condition your home, you're taking air that's already cold and making it cooler. And you're doing that by taking outside air that's already hot, in fact, hotter than the indoor air and making it even hotter. So you're literally somehow pumping heat out of the inside out into the environment. And a, uh, in the winter, when you use it for heating, you're just reversing that process. You're taking cold outside air making it even colder and that's allowing you to take warm out inside air or air inside that's warmer than the outside and make it even warmer still to heat your house even as it cools down. Um, and how does this work? Well, I, I'm not, you know, there are many levels of detail that this can be explained at. I don't, I'm not a good person to do it at the lowest level, but I do find it interesting to just highlight that the way this works uh, is adding just a handful of parts. Be, being able to make a device that can do this in both directions involves adding just a few parts to uh, what is a traditional air conditioner. And all it really does is change where, where the vapor, the heated vapor goes after it comes out of the compressor. So um, heat pumps and air conditioners use a very carefully constructed chemical called a refrigerant that has a lot of desirable properties. It is compressible and then condenses at desirable temperatures. The compressor, which is typically outside and is the thing that makes a large amount of noise, takes cool vapor refrigerant and it makes it hotter. And then the question is just where is that sent first? So in the summer, that is sent to a coil on the outside where it's hotter than the outdoor temperature. Hotter than the outdoor temperature and it cools things down. Um, and it is then brought in indoors where it goes through a metering device, which actually reduces the pressure a little bit, makes the temperature cooler, and it cools down the house, and then the cycle repeats. And in the winter, that the valve is just changed so that the first stop for that heated compressed vapor is actually the inside of your house. So that is cooled down by the inside of your house, and then it is both heated back up when it goes uh, to when it goes back to the compressor. It's heated up by the uh, by the outdoors. So, and it's kind of amazing to think about this. But our unit is uh, certified to run at a reasonable output capacity, even down to an outdoor temperature of minus 15, which means that 
the refrigerant that is going into the outdoor unit is even colder than that. It is actually heated by minus 15 air, which uh, I do accept does seem a little bit like magic. So, uh, and why would you do this? Well, you do this because it is a, just fundamentally a more efficient way of using electricity to generate heat. Um, we, the terminology or the concept we use to describe this is called coefficient of performance. And coefficient of performance is simply the amount of heat that is output by a system relative to the amount of heat or energy that is input. So if you think of an electric space heater, something that just uses electricity to heat up a wire, that has a coefficient of performance of one. The amount of energy that you get out of it is the same amount of energy that you put into it. So one kilowatt of electricity input is one kilowatt of heat output. And efficient heat pumps, I'm giving the example here of what's called an air source heat pump, we'll talk about that in a minute, can have a coefficient performance of three or even higher in some cases. So you actually get more energy out as heat than what you put in as electricity. Uh, so as an example, the Fujitsu units that we have, when they're operating in their sweet spot at a relatively cold outdoor temperature, they actually have a COP of three. So I put in one kilowatt of electricity and I get three kilowatts of heat coming out of the unit on the inside. So you, that's less energy than is used for a typical plug-in space heater and I actually get twice as much heat out. And the heat, it, this isn't a violation of conservation of energy. The heat, again, comes from exchanging heat from, with the environment. So how do we do this? Well, I'll give a few examples of the type of equipment that's actually used to implement this in real homes. I think the first type that I was ever familiar with, and I think that um, it was the first that was widely used, is what are sometimes called uh, geothermal heat pumps, although some people say that's a misnomer, also sometimes called ground source or earth source heat pumps. So here, the coil that's exchanging heat is actually not exchanging with the air, it's exchanging it with a loop that's dug into the ground. Sometimes this is a, a loop that's sort of laid out in a field in a shallow uh, uh, excavation, maybe three to six feet, but more often than not, particularly in more urban environments, this is actually a, a deep well that is dug. And the temperature at these, uh, these depths is pretty consistent for most of the year. And as a result, um, that temperature allows for a pretty high coefficient of performance. So these systems are generally the most efficient ones that are available um, for residential use. And they have uh, minimal they're minimally influenced by the outside temperature. Because they're exchanging heat with the earth, they don't really care if it's cold outside or hot outside, which is part of their advantage. They're very generously subsidized, although that subsidy may be expiring. It is tended to, but they're um, extremely expensive. Uh, and this has tended to favor larger new construction. And as a result, it's less common. Uh, although I do have a neighbor who did this as a retrofit a few blocks away. To give you a sense uh, of what I mean by expensive, this was a house not much bigger than ours. And the system was $55,000 before the rebates kicked in. Uh, and one other thing that, that sometimes uh, causes people to shy away from this is you do need either a large excavation or a pretty large invasive drilling rig uh, in order to do this. So um, on the other side of the table, um, you can install a heat pump that is essentially a drop-in replacement for a traditional furnace and coil uh, that you, many of you might have in your homes right now. So this is one, the picture here is an example from Mitsubishi. This is a, a pretty popular and high-end unit. And uh, it just drops right in. This can integrate with existing ducts if you already have a ducted system in your house. Uh, you can also add to these systems quite easily what are called uh, emergency heating or alternative heating, sometimes also called heat strips. That's what's shown in the upper right-hand corner of this photo. They're essentially a large hairdryer that fits in the ducts. Uh, these can provide heat if the temperature gets too cold and the output isn't high enough, or if you actually have a failure of the primary one. Another nice advantage of these is they can integrate with uh, humidification, which is particularly desirable in our, our environment in the dry winters, and also with filtration. Um, this is sometimes held up as an advantage, particularly in some areas that are now seeing wildfire smoke more frequently. You can actually get very high capacity, uh, uh, high filtration MER filters integrate nicely with these systems. Um, this approach has to be favored by a, um, an online group called HVAC 2.0. Um, a few downsides, though, is, uh, you know, if, it may require adaptation to your existing ductwork, which can be expensive and re does require um, some level of expertise. And if you are unhappy with your existing ductwork, if it's not balanced, if you have hot and cold spots, uh, this isn't going to do anything to help it. It inherits essentially any flaws that you have in your existing duct setup. Uh, another type of device, uh, it's getting more popular now, and this is ultimately what we went with, and I'll talk about that a little bit, uh, are called mini splits, so the, or sometimes also called ductless mini splits. So these are a similar looking outdoor unit for the compressor, but the indoor unit is actually something that just sits on a wall. It doesn't require any ductwork. Um, it's just there and all you have to run are is electricity and refrigerant lines, which are much smaller than ducts. These tend to be among the most efficient air source heat pumps you can get. Um, one thing I was really drawn to in these is that they have very, what's called deep modulation, which is modulation is simply the uh, difference between the highest output they can give and the lowest output. So um, you, these units can run very efficiently at extremely or relatively low amounts of heat or cooling, which is very nice, particularly in the shoulder seasons. And particularly during heating, I just, I, I can't say enough good things about having this modulation. They essentially find the level of heating or cooling you need 
and they run at that level more or less continuously circulating air. It's a very gentle heating and cooling. It's very comfortable and very pleasant. Um, these are also just simpler to install, particularly um, you know, as, a, as a net new installation. All you have to run are uh, some relatively small lines. You may have seen actually there are now units that are uh, sold under the brand name Mr. Cool that you can actually easily install yourself without specialized equipment. Um, I like them in our use case, and I'll talk a little bit about this later, uh, because if you use more than one of these, they provide a level of redundancy. They're all like self-contained pairs, essentially. Um, but they do tend to work best in homes like ours, where we have a relatively open floor plan, or in homes that are already um, quite well insulated and well sealed. So you don't actually have to have one of these in every room if your house isn't particularly leaky. It will act, it heat will act, heating or cooling will actually dissipate reasonably well if you already have an efficient home. And in fact, I was originally drawn to these because there are examples of highly insulated new construction where an entire house the size of ours is serviced by essentially one of these units and the heat just heat or cooling just convex around them as needed. That was not what we were able to do, but it was very inspiring to see. And then finally, you'll sometimes see uh, what are, are sort of evolved or larger versions of these sometimes called multi-splits where a single outdoor compressor serves multiple indoor head units. And you can actually have indoor head units of, of different designs. So there are some that fit in ceilings, some that can actually fit and replace wall, um, floor mounted units. They tend to have their own thermostats. Um, these are nice, it's a single unit, you only have to have one outdoor compressor. They do tend to have lower modulation ranges, so they don't have this deep modulation that I talked about that I found so desirable. And um, lower maximum output, so even a very large one of these tends to have only about two times in my uh, experience, the output of a single split. Um, so that's something to take into consideration. And really they are often, sorry, they are often, um, when, recommended by traditional installers, they will recommend putting a head unit in every room. And unless your rooms are very large, that's almost always a bad idea. These head units, although they can lower their output, they can only lower it so far. And what you tend to have is um, uh, units that turn on and off excessively if you put one of these in every room. So it's, an, it's another thing to be aware of. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So, and finally, there's so-called hybrid systems. I apologize, I really couldn't find a great um, diagram for this, but this is just to highlight that actually the traditional AC units that you'll see in our region are actually, you can get bi-directional heat pumps that have almost exactly the same form factor here. They just include that reversing valve hardware that I talked about before. So you can essentially drop in a new outdoor unit and coil and have it coexist with a gas furnace, but still have the heat pump portion of it, the electrically driven portion of it, provide heating for at least some of the season. And the appeal of this, well, it's twofold really. One is again, it's just basically a drop-in replacement for the AC portion of an existing system. And it allows you to not worry about uh, output in the coldest possible temperatures. So if you have a polar vortex event, you know that you've still got a gas furnace there as a backup uh, or if the heat pump breaks down. So, so if any of these sound appealing to you, the, really the next important thing uh, when contemplating this is sizing. And by sizing, I mean simply making sure that the equipment that you have is the correct size, not too big or not too small for your home. Um, with traditional HVAC, there's a variety of things that tend to incentivize systems being a little bit bigger than they need to be, both in heating and in cooling. Sorry, Patrick, come on. Um, basically, if you have a system that's 50% or 100% bigger than it needs to be in heating or cooling, um, it's still going to work, even in the hottest and coldest days. And although it might not be quite as optimally comfortable as it can be because it's sort of blasting cold or blasting heat, uh, no one is going to call you back because they are too cold or too hot in the worst time of the year. So uh, heat pumps, uh, for a variety of reasons, are, are, it's very difficult and it's generally inefficient to size them in this way. One problem is that they tend to just have lower overall capacities, particularly on the heating size. Even a high capacity heat pump has less heating capacity than some of the larger furnaces. So it's very important to uh, get as large a one as you need for what you expect your uh, heat load to be, but not to make it much larger, in part because you might just not be able to find it. Doing a like-for-like -like replacement with an oversized system might, be might not be possible. And if you, did, if you do oversize it, there's more of a penalty. You sort of, you give back some of the benefits that heat pumps have in the first place. A heat pump that is much larger than it needs to be for either heating or cooling is going to turn on and off. And this is generally one of the least efficient ways for these things to operate. So they call it short cycling and uh, it just makes it more expensive and less efficient, which is honestly, you know, cuts against the reasons that many people want to install these in the first place. And it's also less comfortable, as I said, when it's cycling on and off, you get a blast of heat or a blast of cold. Um, an important concept to introduce here about determining your load is this notion of design temperature. This is something that's used by architects 
and HVAC technicians. It is essentially for a given region, the temperature that it stays either hotter than or colder than 99% of the season. So it's not that it never gets hotter or cooler than this, but that the vast majority of the time, if you have a system that can hold the temperature at this design temperature, you will have a happy customer. And actually in Chicago, at least in, in my part of Chicago, which is closer to the lake, I think this would probably be a little lower in the Western suburbs. That number is zero degrees Fahrenheit. Again, this isn't saying that uh, it never gets below zero F, but it rarely gets below zero F. And, um, uh, and that you, are, you could be well served by a system that can hold heating at zero degrees Fahrenheit. Um, I'm gonna talk about three different ways that you can actually determine what this load is, what the demand for heating is gonna be. Um, one of them that is used if you don't already have a structure is called manual J. This is essentially a series of calculations. It's a standard calculation that you can do where you input a lot of low level details about the structure, uh, what the insulation is in the walls, what the insulation is in the ceiling and the floor, uh, whether you have a crawl space or basement and whether that's insulated. And you even enter things like the type of windows and even their orientation. So it knows things about solar gain, for example, from a south facing window versus a north facing window. And this spits out an estimated heat load and cooling load for a given design temperature. This tends to be a little conservative, uh, but again, if you don't actually have the structure there, this is all you can do. What I'll talk about a little bit more is if you already have a structure, if you already have a home, and I think many of you probably do, where you're thinking of doing this, you can actually get a much better estimate of what the real demand is at your design load by looking at uh, your existing HVAC system. So you can do this in at least two ways. Uh, one is you can just look at your bill. You can look over the course of a full month or a full season, see how much energy you used, either in the form of gas or electricity, I'm gonna show gas, and get a sense of what that might translate to in terms of a maximum demand for heating. And if you have a smart thermostat, you can actually go a level better and look on an hour by hour basis at when the equipment is running and really get a, a very, very detailed sense of how much uh, heat was actually put into the structure at, at a given outdoor temperature. So um, I'll give a little terminology and market background here. So I'm gonna be using a, the, um, the unit British thermal units. This is one of those horrible imperial units that uh, if you are an engineer used to metric is uh, makes you shudder. A BTU I believe is the amount of energy necessary to raise one pound of water, one degree Fahrenheit. Um, that's not a, a typical, particularly helpful uh, visceral sense of what that is. To give you a clearer sense, a plug-in space heater, a, a maximum capacity plug-in electrical space heater can provide about 5,000 BTUs per hour of heat output. Um, a small gas furnace, the smallest sizes that you can generally find these days are about 40,000 BTUs per hour of output. Uh, the main furnace in our house, when we bought it was 100,000 BTUs per hour, although we discovered it had been derated to 80. And to get back to a point I was making earlier, a fairly large air source heat pump is, uh, is only in about the 30,000 or 40,000 BTU per hour range. Um, I'll give you two other fun tidbits about um, these units. One thing is you will often hear HVAC people talk about units as one ton of capacity. And a ton is actually 12,000 BTUs per hour uh, of capacity. And the reason that this terminology came about is because 20, uh, one ton of output is enough uh, energy to either freeze or thaw one ton of water over a 24 hour period. And this actually dates back to the time when air conditioning was done via melting water. So if you knew that your building needed one ton, you would order a ton of ice and that's what it was. On the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of output, um, energy planners actually talk about a quadrillion BTUs of output when they talk about national scale use of energy. So US energy use of all forms in 2005 was 100 quads, which is a mere 100 quadrillion BTUs of energy. Just think that's kind of neat. So, um, so let's look at the two different load calculations that I was talking about for our house for our, um, uh, here on Chase Avenue in Rogers Park. Um, this is data that comes directly from the gas company. So this is for the last year before we went fully electric these were the actual gas uses over the heating season. And uh, conveniently enough, the uh, gas company provides not only the amount of gas that you use, but a measurement of how much heating demand there was in this unit heating degree days, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, a heating degree day is essentially the amount of energy that's necessary. Well, it is the difference between the indoor and the outdoor temperature for a full day. So if it was 65 degrees inside and it was 45 degrees outside all day, that's 20 heating degree days. And then the numbers you saw on the sheet before are just that summed up for the overall um, month. And then I've summed it up for the entire season. So for the entire last season, we used 391 therms of natural gas. Each therm is 100,000 BTUs of chemical energy. Uh, I multiply that by the conversion efficiency of our furnace, which is 90%, that's pretty typical. And I divide that by the number of heating degree days, which is uh, 5,538 total. So here I get a number of every heating degree day, I needed to put in 6,400 BTUs of energy. Then I take that number and I imagine a hypothetical day at the outdoor design temperature for heating, which is uh, zero degrees F. We happen to keep the house at 63 F, 
during this period, which I know is a little chilly. We have allowed ourselves to let it get a little warmer now that we're electric. But on that hypothetical day, that would mean 63 heating degree days, 63 minus 0, 63, uh, 63 heating degree days. And if I then plug those two numbers together, I say, well, if, uh, if, if it's consistent with the overall behavior, 63 heating degree days times 6,400 divided by 24 hours means that I, need, I would need on that design day a heat source of about 17,000 BTUs per hour. Now, I made an error when I first gave this presentation, which is those numbers come actually from the period when we already had a heat pump upstairs. And I have from prior data when we had less insulation, it turns out that on average, our downstairs furnace carries about 80% of the load of the house because heat rises. So I'm putting in this adjustment, I'm pretty comfortable with it. So when I account for that fact, I would say, based on just my utility bill, and I would trust this in a, a normal house that didn't have this sort of split system we had, just on the heating bill alone, I can come up with this estimate of 21,000 BTUs per hour and a little end change. Um, so let's go a level finer. I do have a smart thermostat and I actually have a couple of years worth of data, of hour by hour data when the furnace was running. And here I can actually get an hourly you know, indication of what the BTUs per hour input were that are coming from the furnace, basically by doing the same calculation, but only you know, for, for an hour by hour basis. And here, if I actually look at time periods when the temperature lingered around zero F, I see that the furnace was actually putting out about 25,000 BTUs per hour. Um, and that's, by the way, already adjusted for um, that, um, that number, that 80% adjustment that I get. So it's still a little bit higher, although not, not dramatically higher. Uh, I have a few theories about why you might see a difference between the sort of season-wide estimate versus this very fine-grained one. One is I think there's just a natural variation in night versus day. If it's zero and at night and it's clear, there's more heating demand than if it happens to be a sunny day. That difference gets averaged out in the overall data where if I look at some of these zero days, there were probably periods when it was uh, nighttime. Uh, and the other is that there's a, I think, a nonlinear increase in load when the temperature goes down because of air leakage. So the colder it is out, the more air tends to leak because of the so-called stack effect, the sort of a chimney effect in your house. And not only is the more air leaking, but the air that is leaking is colder, and that's sort of an exponential. So, uh, And honestly, you know, you, you can just kind of account for this. And in the worst case, you end up with a modestly undersized system, which here again, you could do something like a hybrid system or supplement with space heaters, or just put on a sweater. Um, or you can just pad it a little bit. So I think e either one of these, uh, truing up a little bit and having a little bit of buffer is fine. Uh, it's, it's certainly still better than what you would typically end up with uh, manual J or uh, you know, doing a like for like replacement with a, a dramatically oversized system. So um, I'm gonna sort of skip through these details and I'll come back to them in the question and answer section. But um, we, you know, this, these, are, these are some details about how we went from our old system to our new system, which we did in stages. We're certainly very confident that we could go much lower in terms of capacity based on these empirical calculations that I showed you. I even had some data from when we did have the most recent polar vortex effect, that even at that extreme cold, which was minus 20, um, the heat load was, was less than half of what the furnace was capable of. So even at that cold temperature, our furnace was turning on and off. It was only on about 50% of the time. So we ended up installing a total of four um, single split um, mini splits, uh, one in the second floor, two on the first floor, and then on a sort of provisional or semi-emergency basis, one in the basement, um, while all the while keeping our gas furnace in place, which allowed us to have that there just in case I screwed up and didn't, um, uh, didn't size them correctly. So I'll just leave through those. This is the one on the second floor, which we installed first, this is the pair that we have on the first floor. And then this was the one we did in the basement. We did discover after um, going full electric that um, the furnace was giving a lot of waste heat in the basement that just wasn't coming from the two on the first floor. So we did have to put a unit down there to stop the basement from being too cold, which tends to make the first floor less comfortable as well because the floor of the first floor was cold. So um, these cost us, the, the three that I had professionally installed cost about $5,000 each. This is a little on the high side. Um, compared to other regions where this equipment is more common, but these were the more reasonable installers that I was able to find. And then um, when I did the self-install, the materials cost was about half that, and, uh, but I did have to invest in about $1,000 worth of HVAC tools, although I'm, I'm happy to loan those out uh, as if other people are interested in it, and I would, I would certainly happily do it again. Um, how did this play out in terms of operating costs? We still people might be interested in that. It, when I did a calculation for our use in January of this year, it was honestly it was close to a wash. Uh, if anything, it was, it was a tad more expensive than, um, than what we would have paid with natural gas, but it was really closer to being a wash. Um, a few things that make this comparison a little more difficult. We did keep it a little warmer with electricity. Um, something that also cuts in the opposite direction is that at the retail level, gas was quite a bit more expensive. I honestly wasn't expecting it to be cheaper, um, but I wasn't expecting it to be that much more expensive either. And I guess the third thing to keep in mind is that in both cases, we did a fair amount of insulation that did lower the cost in either case. 
Another thing I put in here just to give another, another way of thinking about this is if you know how much electricity costs you and you know how much gas costs you, you can come up with what is essentially a, what must the coefficient of performance be over the whole season in order to break even converting to electricity from gas. And here with the numbers that um, I have for electricity and gas this year, the COP that you would need for it to be the same cost is about two and three quarters, 2.74. And that's well within the range of the possible. In fact, I think that's almost exactly what I ended up giving, give, getting, give or take this season. And in fact, I did just before recording this, I looked up, uh, we, our, our heat pumps are, are started cooling about three or four days ago. It won't surprise anyone in the area to know. Uh, and so I called, a, I called a wrap on winter 2021-2022, uh, and we used about 5,000 kilowatt hours, which is really right in the range of what I was hoping for, given a typical winter. I'm quite pleased. And I, I think it really was pretty much the same. It's about 600 bucks, probably the same that we would have paid to heat with gas this year. So we're very happy with that. Um, here's just a little, just to show you, though, it did dramatically change sort of the character of our energy use. Um, it used to be that we used the most electricity in the summer. You can see July of 2020, we peaked at about 735. We are now obviously uh, winter peakers, as you would call it. Uh, January, we used more than double the amount of electricity that we ever had before in a single month. But again, this is the, this is the flip side of the coin I showed earlier where we weren't consuming any gas. Uh, and this is still quite reasonable, quite, quite achievable. It wasn't like we were uh, taxing the wires that come into our home uh, for these things. So uh, if you're interested, by the way, I, did, I have this information thanks to uh, home energy monitor, which I'm very happy with the Emporia View 2. It lets you look at each individual heat pump and other point loads, yeah. like refrigerator, um, things like that. So, um, I was asked to, the two things that were not in my original version of this presentation, and, and I'm afraid neither of them do have great answers to give, but the first one was, how can I find an installer? And this is indeed the billion dollar question. Um, just pure heat pumps for homes are just not commonly done in our region. Natural gas is widely available. It has until very recently been fairly inexpensive. So it's been difficult to justify uh, installing a heat pump. So there just aren't a lot of installers that are familiar with it. Um, and the installers that are tend to be uh, focused on high-end equipment. So it's ground source and it's also things like the high-end equipment from Mitsubishi and Fujitsu, which are more often targeted at new build homes. Um, another thing that contributes to this sort of lack of familiarity with this is simply that uh, most people do not purposefully replace their HVAC equipment before it fails. And as a result, most equipment is replaced on an emergency basis, which is a time when people are generally not interested in trying something new. So part of what you have to sort of commit yourself to if you're gonna make this change is doing so on a non-emergency basis uh, so that you can have some time to plan. So uh, my best suggestion based on my experience is uh, get comfortable with what you think the size of the system is that you need. This is really um, probably the most important thing to get right. It's something that, as I say, the industry tends to incentivize getting it wrong on the high end, and that's just not a, a, not a good way to go when you're trying to go all electric. You're gonna end up with a, a system that's more expensive than it needs to be, and is probably less comfortable than it, than it could be as well. And it's gonna cost more to operate. So go through this calculations that I talked about, get comfortable that you know what your heat demand is, and then engage a contractor and be prepared to engage several contractors with the sizing in mind. If your experience is anything like mine, you're gonna encounter the, uh, many people will dismiss the idea out of hand uh, because they are used to sizing more conservatively. And so you just have to be prepared to be patient, uh, to be uh, perhaps brushed off a little bit, but stick to your guns. Uh, and that was how I was ultimately able to find, in the end, two installers. Uh, one, the one that I used for the upstairs wasn't available and responsive when I wanted to do the downstairs, but both were willing to do roughly what I was interested in. They were willing to trust my calculations, in part by me promising that I would own any failure on this point. Um, and I'm always happy with what I got. Um, and then the other question I was asked to talk about just briefly is what about, what about improvements other than electrification? So, and in particular insulation. And this is also uh, somewhat fraught. That what, what insulation needs to be done and whether it makes sense is very variable and site specific. Um, and the impact of individual interventions tend to vary quite a bit. Um, people who, who do this a lot uh, oft find that it's pretty difficult to sell this on a cost payback basis. Um, it is better ultimately to go into any kind of insulation or air sealing improvements with the notion that you're going to be reducing your energy consumption, which is just good on its own merits, but it also makes things more comfortable. And that's definitely the case for our home. We've done quite a bit of retrofit insulation and sealing over the years, and the home is much more comfortable than it was 10 years ago as a result, even if it isn't necessarily uh, earning that back in money. Uh, and in our case, at least, doing enough retrofit to reduce the load substantially really made the difference between electrification being viable and being kind of out of reach. So we were able to do with four, you know, I think I, I say later on in the slide, we were able to uh, reduce the load about 50%, and that led to us being able to realistically heat the home this season, even at down to minus five with uh, the four units we have, and really only two of them were working all out in that case. Um, 
one other general guidance that I see pretty uh, consistently, and I, I tend to agree with based on our experience, is that it's good to emphasize air sealing over insulation. Uh, so people often will, uh, you know, people will market that they can blow a huge amount of insulation into your attic. That's great, but if you have a lot of air leaking out of there, it doesn't really do nearly as much good. Um, the one sort of exception to this rule is if you happen to know that you have a home that has empty wall cavities, you can actually accomplish both at the same time by doing what's called blown in insulation, particularly dense pack insulation, either fiberglass or cellulose. Um, another bit of advice here is, um, is it's often best to do this or easiest to do this uh, cost efficiently if you combine it with other products, projects rather. So we, for example, when we first moved in, we desperately needed to replace the siding on the house. And while we were doing that, it was much easier to make that the time that we did some external rigid insulation. Likewise, if you do have empty wall cavities and you want to fill them in, they have to drill holes to do that, which they then patch up. So if you happen to be painting, it's a good time to think of maybe having that done beforehand and then they can paint over the patches. And then here, just to give a sense of what our investment is, we did really three major projects over the course of about 10 years. It led to a 50% reduction, which I said has made the house possible to electrify and much more comfortable but it has only saved only, I say, but it's saving us about $500 a year. Why do I say only? Well, overall, I think if I try and subtract out just the retrofitting cost, it was about $25,000 investment. So, you know, a 50 year payback is, uh, is, is I don't think, it's worth. well, it isn't the primary reason for doing it. Um, and just to go into a little bit of detail, we, the sequence that we did this in, as I said, we put external rigid insulation, which I think also helped improve air sealing. Um, when we had the siding repair, that was about $10,000. Um, we had foam put into our second floor walls when we had the second floor renovated. That was about $10,000, actually quite expensive. And um, uh, when we had our, uh, just as a, an independent project, we had uh, the empty wall cavities on our first floor filled with blown-in insulation and also sealed up our basement and rim joist area with foam. And that was only $5,000. This was actually, I think, by far the most efficient one. And it had a significant impact, particularly air sealing the basement overall. And that was about $5,000. So it just gives you a general sense of what the cost can be. So that's it for my initial pre